Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Nina Taft uh, uh, for her presentation. Nina is currently a senior research scientist uh, at uh, Intel Research Berkeley. At Intel, sh her work uh, focuses on enterprise network traffic uh, characterization and anomaly detection at both the uh, enterprise and the host level. Uh, prior to joining Intel, Nina worked at uh, Sprint for five years in the IP group working on backbone internet environment. She also has uh, worked at SRI for four years. Nina received uh, her PhD degree from UC Berkeley in 1994. She's currently associate editor for the IEEE Transactions on Networking Journal. And she co-chaired uh, CCOM 2007 recently. Uh, she's a member of the ACM Internet Environment Conference Steering Committee. Okay, Nina. Thank you very the floor much. Here. Thank you. I'm happy to say I'm now the past chair of SICOM, so I'm done with that. <laughs> uh, okay, so I, I thought I would talk to you today about some work that uh, we've had going on for about a year, a year and a half or so um, at Intel in, in Berkeley, and this is joint work with uh, a bunch of people on campus at UC Berkeley as well. Um, and this work was initially motivated by just observing this sort of very happy obsession we have nowadays with collecting enormous amounts of data and throwing data mining algorithms at it. And the approach is always, well, let's just collect everything we possibly can and then afterwards we'll analyze it and we'll, we'll try to improve the performance of an application. So in retrospect, when you sort of stop and look back, you can say, well, you know, do I really need to collect all the data that I'm collecting? Um, and so that's really what this talk is all about. Can we get away with collecting less data and still do our favorite data mining applications? Well, we've picked, a, you know, there's a couple here that I'll, I'll talk about, but I think there's an interesting uh, sort of potential work, area for work um, given that data mining is used for so many things. So the tr sampling is the traditional way to sort of lighten the burden of data collecting. And I'll come back at the end and show you why sampling has possibly some, some serious problems and isn't necessarily the best way to lighten the burden of collecting data. Uh, this is roughly the order in which I'm going to talk. Uh, so let's just start with a simple example here. I've got, I want to do, a, uh, in an enterprise network I want to find out if I have a bunch of machines that have been recruited by a bot master and they're participating possibly in some attacks. So uh, this is a simple scenario. I have an external command and control center that compromises a bunch of hosts in my enterprise, installs the software, and then tells them all to go and send a bunch of connections to some victim, which is possibly outside your enterprise. So what's done a lot today is that you, know, you have uh, monitors that sit at the routers that collect data and feed it to an operations center when things are analyzed afterwards. And the kind of data that can be collected at a router is, can be very, very detailed. You can watch the byte rates on all your links at very small time scales. Now, all that has to get shipped to an operations center where it can be post-processed and, and analyzed and so on. So the question here really is, you know, that is potentially an enormous amount of data to send. And just a few more comments about why this is possibly a problem. So, if you think about general large-scale network monitoring systems, um, they, okay, we're using distributed collaborative boxes, and the things that you're monitoring are the time series, right? You're monitoring some feature and you're measuring it every minute or every five minutes, whatever your time series it is. And then it's backhauled here to all this data is backhauled to some central site, okay? So there are two problems with this. One is that, uh, the data, so I'm thinking about SNMP data in this case, you know, is collected every five minutes. So if the data is only backhauled every five minutes, then your detection time to detect an anomaly is going to be on a five minute time scale. So the detection time is very slow here. But in addition, uh, yeah, all of this information which is coming back um, can create possibly a bottleneck when you are close, you know, to the operations center, depending on how much you're backhauling. Okay, so it may be fine, you can transmit on this hand, but if you've got thousands of monitors all backhauling to a single place or even to a couple of places, 
you can create an overload there. Uh, yeah, okay. So there, there are two things. One is, you know, creating possibly congestion on the links here, depending what kind of a link this is, and possibly just simply overloading the operations center. So if you want to take a lot of the detectors we use today, and we want to scale them up, so you want to have more monitors, you want to detect things at smaller time scales, and you want to track more features, not just your five favorite features, but possibly hundreds of features, then, you know, we believe that anomaly detectors need to scale. So our goal in this work is to take some example anomaly detection algorithms and make them perform just as well as they do, but, you know, with less data. So we use all these terms, communication efficient, reducing communication bandwidth, it all means the same thing. Okay. The other thing is that if we can actually do this at smaller time scales, then we could enable possibly continuous detection, or really this means at very small time scales. Okay, so, so why does the scalability matter? So some of these cases are obvious. In, in wireless networks and sensor networks, you may have limited bandwidth resources. In enterprise networks, um, there may, the, the, the extent of over-provisioning is usually pretty, uh, what's the word, spotty. Um, at Intel, for example, we do not over-provision between different sites. You may have a lot of connectivity in a building, but you don't have a lot of connectivity between different office sites that are in different states or even across different countries. But I would argue that even in the case of ISPs, which are currently quite over-provisioned, once you're talking about monitoring things at a very small time scale, maybe milliseconds or seconds, and you've got thousands of features to monitor, <laughs> you could end up in a situation where, you know, half of the traffic an ISP is carrying is monitoring traffic. So I believe that even in their case, there is interest in trying to reduce the amount of data they collect for these sorts of tasks. And now the other observation is that anomaly detectors are a natural candidate for thinking about data reduction. Okay, so we're usually the kinds of schemes that we're talking about here are collaborative schemes. So you have many monitors located all over the network. But it, most of the time, if you're looking for anomalies, the data should be normal, okay? And the detector at those times doesn't need a precise state, a precise understanding of the state of, of the network. It's, it's good enough to have an approximate sense of things. Okay? And I'm talking about here anomaly detectors that track particular features. In, in a moment, I'll come to, to a specific example. Um, and a lot of these things work by thresholds. They, they track, you know, the number of simultaneous TCP connections or the TCP connections going to a particular destination. And when it exceeds the threshold, they raise a flag. So these are just some examples. So only when you sort of start to get into a sort of what looks like a suspicious zone do you have to worry about having a more precise sense of the network state. All right, so this is just a very simple conceptual example. But suppose you're tracking the number of TCP connections and the black line is some threshold. When that exceeds a certain level, then you want to flag it. And this blue line here is just the sum of those connections over time. So as long as you're in, you know, the white zone, you don't need to know exactly what this, this sum of TCP connections is very precisely. When you're getting a little hotter, you might want to know a little more. And certainly when you're close to what's considered attack levels, you want a more precise sense of things. So most of the time, you know, you're, you're the, this time series process is going to be down in this sort of safe zone. Okay. Now, what happens when we do data reduction? What are the ramifications? Okay, the decisions that you're making are based on approximate data. Okay? And you need to be able to deal with approximations. Approximations will cause you to make some mistakes. Okay? Either in terms of misdetections or false alarm. So fundamentally, as soon as you start doing approximation, you have to think about the detection accuracy. And it's interesting, you know, we set as one of our goals this ability to trade off the accuracy versus, versus the burden of collecting data. Okay? All right. So let, I'm going to talk now about a particular kind of anomaly detector that a bunch of you may already know about. Um, so we're looking for uh, anomalies. These are volume anomalies in what's called origin destination flows. So take a backbone network of an ISP or an enterprise. Uh, in this case, it's an example of ISP. And you, an end-to-end -end flow is really, you know, from one host to another host, and it traverses a path through the ISP network. You know, you can see anomalous, uh, anomalies happening due to DDoS or flash crowds or even, you know, device failures and so on. So what happens is when there's a little bit of traffic here, see this is a very light pointer, um, which may 
manifests itself as a small burst, then intuitively that burst will really appear on every link it traverses. And you can imagine that by cross-correlating the links from one to another, you can possibly make this stand out in a more obvious way. So the task here is to detect volume anomalies. And the, the algorithm I'm going to show you right now is not something we developed. This was developed by Anukul Lakina and, and Mark Cravella and, and Christophe Jo. But what we're going to do is take their algorithm and, and throw out the bulk of the data that it collects. Um, so you know, they, roughly they imagine an infrastructure that looks like this. At every router, you've got monitors that track the traffic on the links. And it all gets backhauled to some, we call it a coordinator here. You can call it a NOC, whatever, whatever you like. And, OK, so I think I've said most of this. You, you, the idea here is to correlate the time series across the different links. You use both temporal and spatial correlations can be used. And this detection algorithm came out of what was a, a first paper um, by Anakul and a bunch of people showing that if you look at the ensemble of all the OD flows in an enterprise network, so all the end-to-end -end pairs together, it seems like potentially a high-dimensional set of data it actually resides in a low dimensional space and can be described by a low dimensional subspace. Given that observation, they built an anomaly detection algorithm based on principal components analysis, which helps you to extract that low dimensional subspace. So their algorithm works something like this. This is a summary. The idea is to separate the normal from the abnormal traffic. And the idea is to think about two subspaces, one which is normal and one which is abnormal. And you want to take the traffic and map it onto these two different subspaces. The normal subspace will be described by the top principal components. Turns out you only need a few, like four or five is typically enough. And everything else gets mapped onto the uh, an anomalous subspace. So you take a traffic vector y, and by doing projections, you split it into two separate components. And then they do a little additional post-processing on this residual traffic vector. So this first paper was published in SIGCOM of 04. Uh, and just to give you a, a little hint about why this is powerful, this is an example of a, a traffic stream, uh, I believe taken from Abilene. And the moments where anomalies occurred, this is just the regular traffic vector y. That's, y is a vector of, of all links in the network. And you're just taking a, a squared error predictor. And the red circles are moments when anomalies occur. And so you can see that in the regular subspace, in the regular measurement space, these things don't stand out at all. When you map it into this anomalous subspace, and now look at the, the you know, squared error predictor, the anomalies stand out in a much cleaner way. So their algorithm worked like this. You've got a network, and what you do is that from each link, you collect every five minutes just the volume of data on the link. You build a big data matrix, and so what this matrix is here is that every column corresponds to a link and every row corresponds to a time slot. So every five minutes, you get another row in, in this traffic matrix. OK, they do principal components analysis on that matrix. OK, and from that, you extract this projection, CAB, which projects the data onto the abnormal subspace. You also extract a, a Q statistic, OK, which is going to be the, level, the threshold that you allow. And this is basically the bottom line. Okay, this is the criteria which, which they use to check. So you take the traffic, you map it onto the space, you take a squared prediction error, and see if it exceeds the Q statistic. And you can do that with a you know, 1 minus alpha confidence level. So the key thing here to remember is that this is the criteria that is being tracked by this particular detection algorithm. OK, so we would claim that as soon as you know, this requires that every five minutes, every link backhauls all its measurements to a central operating, uh, an operating center. So we claim that if you want to go to small subscales or have it grow the number of monitoring devices to thousands, that this won't scale very well. So we have what we call a sort of decentralized version of this. And the ideas here, there are a couple of ideas. One is to engage the monitors themselves into doing filtering, smart filtering. So the, because the, mon the, the distributed monitors are local, they can basically, they don't have to operate on these five-minute time boundaries. They can track the traffic all the time. But they filter, and I'll tell you how we do this. This is really the, the meat of, of the method. Um, they decide when they're going to push information to the NOC and when they won't. Okay? 
Now, of course, as I said, this is going to generate approximations. We have to learn how to deal with approximations. So we use statistical learning methods. Um, and the idea here is that we want to bound the error that will be made. And say, if, you know, if we can't tolerate more than a 1% uh, error, how much filtering can you do with the local monitors? Okay, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. And then we need sort of a framework for, for putting all these bits and pieces together. Let me, let me uh, so, so the idea here, just coming back to our initial example, is that rather than sending the full time series of data, what we do is you're going to smooth out the data. Okay, and with this particular example, you can see you only need to tell the operation center every time there's a change in your, in your, in your, in your time series here. While nothing is changing over here, the operation center doesn't need to know anything. It can assume that what you previously told it is still valid. Just interrupt me anytime if, if you have questions. Okay. And so now the idea is to simply send the approximate uh, information over to the operations center. Okay, so this is the framework that we have. You have these distributed monitors that are each monitoring a, a continuous time series. They're going to do some filtering, smooth the traffic out, and only send the smooth uh, time series or information over to this central coordinator. So the coordinator will do the PCA kind of analysis. And it's going to use, we're going to use perturbation analysis. And really the idea here to think about it is that the original PCA algorithm is operating on a matrix of data. If I don't collect information all the time, that matrix gets, or some entries in the matrix will get stale, will get out of date. So then what I'm doing is I'm operating on a perturbed matrix. It's an approximate matrix. So by using matrix perturbation theory, we can bound the errors that are made. Okay? In other words, I don't want my matrix to ever be erroneous by more than so much. So, and what you do with that knowledge then is to generate these delta are the parameters, and I'll, I'll show you what they are in a moment, that get fed back to the monitors and that tells them how to filter their traffic. Those parameters tell them when you need to update the coordinator and when you don't. Now, this framework is pretty general. That detection function could be a simple linear function. I'm going to talk to you about PCA today as an example to walk through uh, how we did the approximations. We've done another paper on botnets that uses Q overflow in the detection as a means also to control botnet detection without collecting too much data. This detector function could, in general, be any sort of outlier kind of, of method. And so we believe, or we hope, <laughs> that this framework can be applied generally. I'd love to encourage other people to take existing detection algorithms that they have and try to do it by, by you know, working with less data. Uh, yes? Uh, does uh, this command parameter uh, change continuously, or you just set it uh, based on the user input? Um, it changes slowly. The way that we've done it, but I, I mean, I think that's a decision that can be made. The way we've done it is we don't change those parameters unless the coordinator notices that the parameters themselves have changed a lot. So it can recalculate what they should be. You can do that periodically. That's what we tried. Um, and as long as they don't really change you very much, we don't send any feedback. If we start to see that there's been a big change, then we'll re-download a new set of filtering parameters. For, the, for what we looked at, it turns out, you know, once every three, four days is enough. But I think it depends on the detector, right? This is all based on that criteria we were tracking, that one formula that, that I showed. So here's sort of what happens at the, at the end hosts. Um, the idea, again, is don't send data if it doesn't really change much. And so the end hosts are basically given a filter sort of a certain size. It says if your traffic lies within this range, if you transmit at any moment in time within this range, don't send anything. Okay? The coordinator is going to assume you're somewhere within this range and that's good enough. Now, if you transmit a data point, if you're sending, you know, the amount of volume you send is outside this bound, well then that gets pushed. So that's just one node that's uploading a measurement back to the operations center. And the operations center may decide or may not but in fact, it wants to change these filters at each of the end hosts, and it might just decide to change three of them, or you know, a subset of, of the filters. Okay. 
So whenever a monitor sends an update to the coordinator, it sends it's the value of the time series and this thing called MOD is short for model, a predictive model of what you think the data is going to be in the future. So when I send you nothing in the next time slot, the coordinator will use that model as a sort of prediction. Now the model could really be anything. In our case, it turns out that we don't really need anything too sophisticated. Um, so we just send an update again, like I said. If, if the, if, if, well, you, you track the data locally as fast as you can, as fast as your local monitor can function. And if you drift from what you told the coordinator you're going to be by more than a certain amount, then you need to send them some new information. So I predict I'm going to be transmitting whatever it is, you know, 55 uh, kilobits. And as long as I'm within plus or minus a delta of that range, yeah. Are you assuming that the communication channel between the monitor and the coordinator is reliable, and hence the lack of information is assumed to be status quo? Yes, we are. We are, in this case, we are. So more than that, we're even assuming for the moment that it's we're not taking into account the transmission delay of sending this message. So all that are, are you know, variations that we have, we have to look at still, how that impacts this thing. It, it probably would just make the filtering a bit more conservative. But... <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I, I'm guessing it, it, it may just be an implementation detail you could just send. I mean, all you want to know is whether whether it's a loss of message or the monitor is dead, because that's Correct. the assumption you... I mean, there may be ways to deal with it. Well, or you, you could actually have them send things even possibly with some periodicity, maybe a slow one, but some periodicity, so that the monitor, can, right. the coordinator can assume you know you're still alive. Okay. Yeah. So, so, the, uh, so the monitor need to send to the co uh, co co coordinator uh, and uh, model functions for each future range. So each node, uh -huh. if, you, if each node is tracking one feature, uh -huh. then you send two things. You send the, the value of the time series, see where yes. it's like pointing. Okay, the DAT, yeah. and the model at that time instant. But you have a subscript to I. With the oh, I, that just meant for node I. Each I does its own. Ah, oh, I see. I now, see. if you're tracking 10 features, then you need to send 10, I see, I 10 see. estimates of the future oh, okay. value. Okay, I see, I see. Sorry, but that I was, was a, an index in, to the uh, monitor, to into a node. I see. So it, it, it's, it, uh, well, I think what you're asking is something different. If each single node tracks multiple features, yeah, yeah. then for each feature you need to send one estimate of the future, correct? So it turns out for the data that we used, you know, the, the, oops, this model is, uh, hold on, here we go. <laughs> uh, taking an average of the last five values is sufficient for predicting the future. And that may be because there's a certain smoothness in these time series. This sort of thing, you know, it depends on the data and has to be figured out for e each data set. But even with such a simple predictor, you know, we end up being able to throw out an enormous amount of data later on. Yeah? Do you have enough experience to make a recommendation whether, you know, if I have, say, 10 features, if any one feature is out of range, I should send updates for all 10? Or is sending updates only for the Range so, so that's a great question, and, and we, we haven't tried that because we've just looked at the volume anomalies, which is just byte counts. Um, but I would imagine that you know if the features are correlated, you could possibly predict which other ones might also have to be updated. Um, so, did you have a question? Okay. All right. So this is just a simple illustration. I think it's probably pretty clear that the blue line is the data, the red line is the model, and you know, whenever they are, get too much out of sync, you basically you adjust the model to match the data and, and you send it forward. So the red line is what actually is getting sent to the coordinator. And let me just hop through this. I think it's pretty clear. So, you know, in this particular case, you, if you only send something whenever there's a change over the lifetime of this, this period here, you send about I don't know, eight, eight or nine signals, something like that, instead of every single second, the value of the, of the time series. Okay, so what happens inside this anomaly detection scheme? Y here is, there we go, this is a, a new data estimate coming in from each monitor. Now, it may be empty, but what happens is that you, you create a new vector Y, which are the new estimates, what you think the monitors are doing, and that is determined if you get a new input from the monitor, you stick the data in. If you don't, you take the model that was most recently sent. So what happens is that this matrix here, 
now becomes approximate. So this condition that we were tracking earlier is now based on all the pieces of it become approximate. The data is approximate. My projection, because it's calculated on the data, is also approximate. And my Q statistic, the threshold <laughs> that I'm saying is too much or not enough, uh, is also approximate. OK. Now, this is, this is another issue here, which I'm not going to go into. But if you notice that there are very large changes in these y vectors, at some point you need to actually redo your principal component analysis and recompute your base eigenvectors and so on. I'm not going to go in here to how often that, that happens because it, it's a separate issue, but you can actually do some schemes on this too to reduce the amount of computation that your own node is doing. Um, so let me, before I, let me just pause for a minute and talk about why this enables what we call continuous tracking. And I touched on this earlier, but the monitors are tracking basically as fast as they can, depending on the hardware of the device and the amount of storage you have and so on. They're tracking as fast as they can. Um, and they can send the update to the coordinator whenever they want. So whenever the local trigger condition is violated. If it never gets violated, you don't send anything. But there's no notion of being restricted to a five-minute boundary, right, which is the way SNMP works. So because the monitors track continuously and because the coordinators find out whatever they need to at any time, as soon as it happens, so that's ignoring network delays, basically the coordinator effectively does continuous monitoring by getting the local guys to do it for him. That's sort of the way, way we, we view that. So we, we sort of say we achieve this continuous tracking or near continuous by pushing the functionality to the monitors. Okay, so now the trade-off here is that the more I filter and the less data I send, of course, you know, I'll win because I'm going to send less data, I'm transmitting less stuff to the network, but I can, I'll make additional errors. Okay, so what happens here is that this is the original system, right? This is the constraint I track and this is my data and so on. Okay, in the new world that we're operating in, everything is approximate. This and this, so my PCA is approximate. I'm tracking all this approximate tracking. And so the question is, how big is the difference between this criteria that I'm checking now versus the one that I would if I had all the data? So all the smarts in this system are about how to do the, set those filtering parameters. All right, and let's think for a moment about the errors that propagate through a system like this. So uh, this is in the case where I have full data. From the data, I compute eigenvalues and eigenvectors. I compute my projection matrices. I compute my criteria for checking if it's an anomaly or not. When I'm on this path, so I've only got the model for the data, right, the errors propagate through the entire system. So the error propagation sort of goes, goes this way. But what we need to do, unfortunately, goes the opposite direction. <laughs> and inverting this process is a challenge. So we want to say, OK, I have some user input that tells me how much additional error I'm willing to tolerate by not having all the data. Are you willing to let me make you know, half a percent more mistakes to save, you know, not say not having to send 80, getting rid of 80% of the data? So we, we allow this to be an input that, that an IT operator can choose. And then we have to backtrack and see, oh, if this is my target detection error, how much error can I tolerate in my estimation of eigenvectors and eigenvalues? And given that I have a certain amount of error I can tolerate here, how do I do the filtering? So I'll just try to give you uh, a, a sort of an overview of, of the methods that are used here. So it's basically a two-step procedure. And the first step uses a combination of, of Monte Carlo simulation and a binary search to get from U to epsilon. So we're trying to determine what's a tolerable error in the eigenvalues. And the second step uses this matrix perturbation theory, which says if I have a certain amount of error in my eigenvalues, how do I do the filtering? OK, so let me try to explain these things. So the first step is that we need to understand how you know, an error in the eigenvalue impacts this detection rate. Okay? So the kind of thing that we can know, we know, you know given an eigenvalue error what the impact is on the detection rate, but we need to invert that procedure. And it's not really invertible. So the way we look at it is, is this way, to say that if I had all the data, my detector is going to fire with a certain probability. This is set up by design, right? 
to have a certain, you know, 1% false positive rate or whatever you choose your, your alpha confidence level to be. This reduced data detector fires with this probability, which may be an, the original 1% error plus the additional errors you'll make because you're now operating under reduced uh, data. So it turns out via some fairly complicated <laughs> manipulations, which are in a paper that we have, so you can, you can see it if you want. This beast can be converted to a Gaussian random variable. And then the procedure here is that what you do is you, 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 you start with an E, you guess, okay? And you're going to simulate this, this distribution, um, which is a, turns out, you know, the parameters of the Gaussian distribution are a function of the eigenvalues and so on. Uh, and then you compute what the firing rate would be. And if, if this mu you get is too high or too low, then you go back and through a binary search, you either try a value that's a little higher or a little lower, and you sort of have an iterative procedure until you come to, to an epsilon, which is producing you know, a, a, a firing rate that's acceptable to you. Okay, yeah? Do you have a, like a local optimum in that search? in this uh, revert function because if you have up and downs your local search may only tell you like the converge to a local op uh, optimum. A local optimum is possible. It's possible. But we didn't observe that. Okay. It may just have been a function of, you know, like I said, the data set that we were working with. Okay. So it's a but you're right, in theory it's possible. It's not guaranteed to be a convex function. No. But, you know, you can, you can, I if you end up in a local optimum and you're still not reaching this mu that you need, right? There are ways to force you to bounce out and try a different part of the space, these diversification steps they're called. And so you can, you can pop out and jump to a different place and then start searching somewhere else. Okay, so what we do here for setting the filter sizes is let's assume that, so this, these lambdas are the true eigenvalues and lamb, lambda hat are the estimated ones. And the PCA operates on this covariance matrix, okay, uh, if you've got all the data, and, and a, a hat if you've only got an estimate of the data. So what happens is that the matrix the PCA operates on is basically, you know, your original matrix plus some perturbation. And we want to track and bound that perturbation. So we define something called the error in the eigenvalue, which is just this, you know, a, sort of a root mean squared error. Um, and we want to then bound this error, okay? It turns out by looking at various norms, we took the Frobenius norm of this perturbation matrix, and I won't kill you with all this uh, stuff, <laughs> too much detail here, um, but you can actually develop some, some bounds here. And so given this, the trick now is again to estimate these, these norms in, as a function of the deltas that are fed back to the users. So one theorem that we, we put together assume is, that, is the following, which is it finds a relationship between the lambdas, and this is the, the filtering parameters, um, and this epsilon, which is the upper bound on the amount of eigen error we're willing to tolerate. Okay, we can assume that we can, if we could find the deltas that satisfy this equation, then we would know that the errors will remain below this bound with high probability. Okay. And the coordinator actually has all the information it needs to compute these things. Now, there are various ways of actually solving for these deltas in here. One simple idea is to get rid of this fourth order term here. <laughs> um, but, but so let me just back up. In some cases, you can actually, you know, if you assume, in some uniform cases, you can actually solve this explicitly if you assume a certain amount of uniformity in the traffic. If you don't want to assume uniformity, you know, you can actually measure the variance in the user traffic um, and then feed that in if the users are willing to provide their variance. There's a relationship between the delta and the variance of the time series you're monitoring. But you have, you have one equation about how do you get to the values for the so many of deltas. Uh, so, so um, okay, there are various incarnations of this thing. In, if the case you have homogeneous, you're using homogeneous filters, then all the deltas are the same. That's easy. The other case is that you actually, you get the variance, I think I'm, uh, yeah, I don't have it here, uh, is that you find in a relationship between these deltas and the variance of the process, which again, 
puts explicitly in there, and then you have just the, the lambdas to, to solve for afterwards. Um, I'm missing, there's another equation that I have here which relates the, the sigmas to the, I'm sorry about that, I'm missing one equation in here. Um, but so th those are two approaches that, that, that you could do that. And yeah, let, let me leave it at there. Um, so in order to evaluate this, um, we wanted to um, pick a tolerable deviation of false alarm rate um, and look at the resulting detection using sort of a data-driven emulation. So there are really two approaches here. One is that we got traffic matrices from Abilene with uh, 41 end-to-end uh, -end flows. And in the case I'm going to show you here, we used uniform slack for all the monitors. We actually played with heterogeneous slack, and it turns out, and this is not uncommon actually, that the benefit of using, giving each individual their own performance, their own uh, filtering parameter is really pretty marginal. It doesn't buy you a lot more than the initial huge win you make with using, just using this approach at all, even if it's homogeneous. Um, so we worked with this data set, and then we actually did some other things by which we injected anomalies afterwards. So it, the first part is we just took the original data set as it was. We used uh, Anukul's original scheme for actually classifying when an anomaly did or didn't happen. I looked at a couple of weeks. And so these were the additional target errors you know, you're allowed to, to put in as, as, as that you're willing to tolerate. And you can see that we really did pretty well here while being able to throw out anywhere from 70 to 90 percent of the data. So you really don't need all the data that's being collected. Um, the other thing to point out is that these values here are, are upper bound. They're a tolerable upper bound. The actual error that occurs is almost indistinguishable from the original algorithm. So here we have a rock curve um, with the true positives here. So that's 1 minus the misdetections and false alarms on the x-axis. And just in case anyone hasn't seen these kind of curves before, your ideal rock curve is one that, where am I? Basically would go straight up here to one and comes around here so that you have no false alarms and you catch all positive attacks. And in general, these curves show that each curve, you evaluate your algorithm with different thresholds. And so you can test it throughout this trade-off space of true positives and false alarms. And typically, if one curve lies entirely above the other over here, then that is considered a better algorithm. So here, the blue, blue line, this is hidden because these lines are all overlapping, <laughs> is the original centralized version. And we ran ours in two different incarnations where you're willing to tolerate either 1% or 2% additional errors. Um, and you can see that the performance difference is essentially negligible. So this is, this, these were upper bounds that were given as, as input. Uh, but in terms of the true positives and false alarms, there really is uh, maybe a, a, a couple of cases in here where there's better performance. But the gain, again, is that you know, we're throwing out uh, 70 to 90 percent of the original traffic. Throwing it out. We're not using it. We're not collecting it. So now the obvious question to ask yourself is, well, you know, what about sampling? Sampling is a good way to reduce the amount of data I have to collect. So there was a nice paper that appeared in IMC 06 that showed they looked at, I think, four different anomaly detectors, not, not the PCA one, um, but showed that sampling actually can really be a serious problem, <laughs> okay, that these other d detectors don't work as well. And intuitively, that makes a lot of sense, because if anomaly detectors are all about catching outliers or the rare events in a distribution, and you're using some uniform sampling, there's a good chance you're not going to sample those outlier events. So you can't just, uh, you know, throw data away randomly, which is what you're doing in most random sampling methods. What we've done here is we're really not doing sampling. I suppose if you wanted to call it informed sampling, maybe one could get away with that. But I, I view this as deterministic filtering. You know, the, these filters are being set up based on a particular equation, this, you know, mapping onto the abnormal subspace here, this equation here, right? That's the criteria that we're checking, and based on this thing, we are filtering data. So, 
anyway, I think there, there's, there's, there's lots of more interesting work to be done here on whether every particular anomaly detector, you know, the, the disadvantage of this kind of approach is you have more precise control, but it means every anomaly detector needs to have their own filtering because you're filtering based on some particular criteria. And if you've got 100 anomaly detectors, you know, you're sending lots of different feedback control. Yeah? method. Can other anomaly detectors be similarly inverted, like for what you're doing? Um, I hope so. We've tried one other application, which is, uh, you know, trying to catch, botnets would be an example of it, but, you know, a lot of flows all going to a particular destination. And you can imagine in a corporation you might want to, you know, if you're afraid of people, you know, dosing some websites, you might want to track traffic to all those guys. And, and you, can, you can do a similar procedure for that sort of thing, when you just track sums of TCP connections, UDP connections, that sort of stuff. But, but you know, I, if you have other examples of anomaly detectors that you can propose, I'd love to play with them. So I've only, I've only shown that this works in two particular cases of anomaly detectors. Besides the other detectors the my paper talked about, like? Which paper? This, this IMT 06 paper, you said it's talking about three anomaly detectors in studies. Do you have insight whether you are, such methods would work for those? That's a good question. Um, so I think that um, one of the detectors they did was this uh, threshold random walk stuff that, that came out of, out of ICSI. And the difficulty is that in, in for that kind of anomaly detector, it's not collaborative. It works at a particular router. It observes the traffic at the router and makes a decision based on what it sees locally. And so this particular approach that we've proposed of using, uh, you know, controlling errors in a matrix requires that you get monitoring data from many distributed places. Now, so it's not exactly the same setup, but that doesn't mean that it is a also possible. Uh, but what, what it could mean, I think, is that perhaps matrix perturbation theory isn't the right way to do the reduction. Maybe there's other sorts of sensitivity technologies or sensitivity analyses that can be done to figure out how to reduce the data. I think the matrix perturbation theory, like I said, it, it'll work if, you've got a, if you're operating on a matrix of data. But it's part of a class of algorithms where, for doing sensitivity analysis. And so I think it's interesting to think about other kinds of algorithms that could be used. Yeah? So here you had a decision problem where you were just trying to say binary, is there an anomaly or not? Did you look at sort of more things where I actually want to, uh, you know, sort of made up, but you know, predict the real value? Like, so, so I want to do the decomposition, but now I want to say, oh, tell me how much traffic there is on that link. Gathering data from that link is as slowly as possible. Is this the same framework? Can I use that in that context? Or would so, so you know, it's hard to say because the assumptions here are almost the opposite of what you're talking about. You're talking about sort of a precise tracking of, of state and estimating the future value. And so you need smart prediction models and so on. Whereas here, what we're saying is that you don't, most of the time, you don't need an exact estimate. Only when you're close to a trouble area do you really care to have precise information. So we're almost doing the opposite. You know, I'm saying I don't, I don't need that estimate, that, that, not very often at least. Um, so I think it's a different question. I think it's a different question to be able to do, if, if you're looking at a time series and trying to do est future predictions and estimations, usually you need a lot of data to be accurate in those. Un unless you can limit and say, you know, I only, again, the same sort of thing, I only care about being accurate if I'm in a certain area of the space, you know, when I'm lightly loaded, I don't care then I think this kind of approach might, might be useful. Question. So I can see that your approach can reduce the total amount of data a lot, but it seems that uh, when, a ma when anomaly occurs, actually there will be increased amount of uh, monitoring traffic. Will that make the situation worse? No, no. So what, what would happen is that at the time of the attack, we would collect no more than what the original method is collecting. We will try to collect more and have a better sense at that time. But it's no more than what the original method does. But so so the, the, a lot of the savings comes from the fact that when there's no attack, you don't need to collect stuff. It depends stuff. On, the data, on the delta, right? If you want to have a, a pretty accurate one, say what, uh, zero, uh, point zero 0.01, then 
when the traffic changed dramatically, when the feature changed dramatically, you may send a lot of data. Yeah, you, that's right. But so, so would they have the original method. But, that's the... But, but, but I think a, an issue remains there in the sense like you still have to then provision your network accordingly. And as long as you're provisioning it for that usage, then the gain may not be as much then, right? Or well, that's true, I, except unless if you can provision you know, a certain amount of bandwidth, which you use to track multiple attacks, and you hope that they don't all occur at exactly the same time, right? Then in some sense you can think about some provisioning bandwidth, which is a shared resource across different trackers. But um, it, your point is well taken because the, 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 the difference, well, I should say the original method never attempted to say what happens if I go down to the, you know, the second time scale, in which case they would be sending enormous amounts of traffic. So, you know, they only worried about five minute time scales. They never had to send anything faster than that. If they took the original method and you tried to do this at one second, then you're collecting tons of traffic all the time. <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, so our, ours is never worse than what theirs would have been, but because theirs didn't scale to a smaller time scale, it was never pushed to that level. Whereas what we're hoping to be able to push to smaller time scales. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Um, so how does the, I, I don't know, exactly what, like the central uh -huh. How does it uh, tell the difference between everything that's going fine and one of the nodes has gone down? And that's why it's not sending data. One of those has gone down. Well, that was the question that Ratul asked oh, right. earlier. We're assuming that the communication channel is up okay. and that there is a way of sending that. Yeah. Right, for the moment, for the moment, we, we, don't, we don't have to figure out how to deal with that. Going back to Dave's question, uh, to estimate the amount of traffic uh, going on on each link or in the total, isn't that to just change the function? Like you currently have this uh, norm over d times by y squared greater than alpha or something. Then in that case, it would be just a sum over the data no, as no, the no, last it, row. Then that no, no, has an error. No, 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 no. So the thing is that this this yes. thing has an underlying time scale. You assume that yeah. this, right, that the data matrix, th these things come in. You have this big matrix, yes. and each time a, a, a new a new time slot comes, let's assume we're operating every second, you stick something new in the top of the matrix and maybe you throw out some old stuff. Okay, so we, we've actually looked at matrices which are, keep a day's worth of information in them. Okay, so every, every time you get a new estimate for Y, it goes in on the top and... and, but, and but you, uh, wh why would that be a problem? Like you just uh, estimate the top row of Y always, you just you forget about everything else? Well, no, 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 no. So there's two different things. One is that, that this, a, a new data value comes in from all the links. And it, it won't actually be from all of them because some of them are not yeah. sending you anything. Yeah. And you, you just do this projection mapping. You have to keep that matrix up to date because every so often, okay, you actually have to recompute this projection. Okay, it's not stable for all time. It's a function of the data itself. So that has to be, I mean, we found, fortunately, it only needs to be recomputed every three days or so. And that may be a weekend effect. It's more likely that if we did it Monday and Saturday, that might be enough for the whole week. Uh, so there's two different things going on. Um, and so yeah. Basically, I'm saying if you uh, change the criteria and uh, they change so often, you need to change the parameter very often, then that may not You don't want to change that parameter very often. I mean, you can still do it. Ideas. If you yeah. turn it into a bunch of decision columns, if you only need to know which range it is in. Yeah. It's, it's just a, yeah. You, you can use an arrow, allow a big arrow, give an arrow bound the liner so that you can control that. Kind of thing. Correct, correct, right. Yeah. You mentioned that actually using heterogeneous uh, deltas didn't help a lot. Yeah. Could it be because of the way that you checked it on, you tested it on uh, emulation, which probably just random, well, uniform random uh, No, 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 no. So, so there have been a lot of other people that have studied, actually. You have the base traffic matrix. And there was another paper in IMC05 that showed if you look at traffic matrix statistics, how you can build attacks that, that sit on top of that network that have properties of, of real attacks in terms of height and duration and, and the spread and so on. So we took 
ideas from other papers in terms of how you inject synthetic anomalies. I, I agree with you. You're right. If you inject uh, some sort of standard simple set of uniform anomalies, then the heterogeneity isn't going to help you. The intuition is that we thought originally the heterogeneity would matter because the baseline traffic series at each of the monitors are quite different. Some of them are low and some of them are heavy. Um, I'm guessing that what happens is that when you do the uniform approach, the filtering parameters it gives out are more tailored to the elephants. As long as they're controlled, then the mice can be, the, the heavy flows, you know, those are the ones where the filtering perhaps really matters. Whereas the very light flows, I haven't actually checked that. That's just a guess. Uh, but I've heard that this is not uncommon, actually, for people who work in information retrieval. That the, the gain you get by heterogizing, heterogeneizing, what's the word? <laughs> by making the feedback heterogeneous, uh, tends to be small in terms of the gain that you get by just controlling it well to begin with. You know, sort of the, starting out with a homogeneous approach as opposed to nothing. So. Yeah, and just wonder how much of the data. No, I understand your question. I, I, I understand. I understand. So, so I, I, I can't answer you as to, you know, it's a question of whether the attacks injected will match the way that somehow the style of filtering we've done. So, but all I can say is that the attacks we tried were ones that were supposed to reproduce what people have seen in, in traffic. Did you have a question? Just a comment on what Ratun said. Uh, unless you provision for the peak, it seems if there is an attack, uh, because of the increase in uh, traffic for the information being relayed back, that might exacerbate the attack itself. Sure, sure. But, but our, our goal here was to sort of beat the performance of the centralized algorithm. Uh, and, and in that sense, we stay the same or below uh, in terms of the volume of data collected. So, so, so in terms of just... Um, I mean, I'm just thinking back in the sense, like, it, it seems a natural method for somebody to, if, like, you know, doesn't know about this work and just starts from the problem statement, is to use hierarchy or something like that to cut down on the amount of information exchange across the wide area. I'm just assuming if, is, has anybody studied that, or you think it would... You mean to or organize yeah. subnets and have a summary of that data right. get sent back and so on? Right. No, I, no, I haven't seen any work to that effect. It's done, but just it's linear. Linear right. Well, the other thing, though, that the other thing, the other thing that happens here is that, so you have a topology, and these origin destination flows are going through between all all node pairs. Some of them are heavier than others, and this algorithm knows the correlations between these flows, right, and which links tend to exhibit similar behavior because they have a common subset of end-to-end -end flows traversing them. And so that actually can play in here, right, I mean that, that if two links are very highly correlated, maybe you only need traffic from one and not the other. So when you build that hierarchy, it might not be trivial to do because it depends on where the traffic is flowing and which links are carrying similar end-to-end -end flows, and that could change. So I don't know that one could find a single hierarchy which remains the best all the time. So, so, so maybe wide area links it does not, but I'm assuming once you, once you talk about a setting in which you have thousands of monitors, somewhat naturally a hierarchy mm -hmm. would arise in there, right? Like if no, it's I, the network, you know, it could be a pub or the west coast or something like true. that. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So fun thing to try, but I, I don't know of any work in that space. Yeah. Well, but if I started trying to divide up sort of groups of monitors that were independently running the detection on it, and I assume detection accuracy would drop because this PCA analysis depends on sort of looking at a whole bunch of data across the whole thing and finding these that's, correlations. So that's what, what I mean, uh, I guess I was assuming that if, suppose there's a, there's a sub-coordinator for a group, the coordinator then could decide for whatever monitors are reporting to it whether or not to send the data on or but, but there's an interesting point here, which is that the notion of being able to claim that I can find a low dimensional representation for the entire data set means I need to know, have an accurate view of that, at least to begin with, <laughs> before I can make that claim. 
And so if one had to track whether the PCA itself, the original computation needs to be updated, you might actually need a fairly precise sense of where things are. But, but you know, I think it's an interesting thing to think about. I mean, it's a <laughs> so let me see what else do I have here. I think that's it, actually. Yeah. So the good news is that we can, we can do detection with, you know, about 80% or a little bit more less than, than others. So I, uh, and we can do this with proving mathematical guarantees on any additional uh, error that's incurred. So I think what's, what's, what's general about this framework is that, you know, one could imagine possibly playing with different sorts of prediction models, different detection functions, and, uh, you know, different thresholds and still being able to do this kind of thing. Now it's true that, you know, for each anomaly detector, you will have to reevaluate exactly how much data can be thrown out because but that's like any data mining algorithm. It all depends on how variable your input data is and so on. All right, so we have three papers that have been uh, published describing all of this stuff. Most of this is all on my website. Um, so just a couple other things that, so what I talked about today was this particular application here. Like I said, we have done another work where we track botnet attacks, where, you know, we, here we have to track the sum of TCP connections. Um, and uh, I believe that there are other things one can think about tracking in systems. So, you know, if, you're in, if the application is a sort of load balancing across servers or subsets of servers, might want to track the load on these different subsets. And then the query that you have to sort of track is, is a set comparison kind of thing. You might want to find the top K hottest sensors and, and, and so on. So we're hoping to be able to sort of play with different kinds of, of applications, all of which basically work on distributed monitoring data. I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> okay.